was a full town of countless stores, gas stations. We had our own bank, our own post office, and anything any, any other town would have. It was a habit in the summertime of everybody would sit out on their front porches, and they'd all say hello to me. I never worried about my safety. I never worried about not being able to get help. It was a safe place to grow up. A lot of times we didn't lock our doors, and, 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 and life was sweet. Picnics in the summertime, um, out on what we call the picnic ground. They had the block parties up by this church or oh, the school yeah. up there. Yeah. They'd have hot dogs and that, a couple of rides for kids. A lot of kids. cool rides for kids, yeah. It was, it was good. I was working in Jersey, but every time I came up to visit my family and stuff like that, I'd, you'd just see a house or two gone here, and next time they come up, another one or two gone. Just a slow process, you know. This particular 100 block was home to about 10 families back as far back as the 1980s. Uh, now I'm the last person left on this block and on this entire street for that matter. My last neighbor, Joe Moyer, who lived on the intersection of West Park and Locust Avenue, passed away two years ago. So I'm, I'm the last person remaining now. Even at night now, there's nothing visible, but at one time, you know, a couple years ago when you'd come up here, you could actually see the ground glowing either, you know, red from the fire or sometimes blue. And blue would be from the methane gas burning off. It was, it was kind of wild looking at night, you know, when you see these blue flames coming up out of the hillside. <laughs> I pretty much walk through town almost once a day. And one day, you know, the ground is as you see it. The next day, you take a walk through and there's a huge gaping hole in the ground. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. There, there are a couple areas here where, like I said, the fire was so close to the surface that I actually did see, you could see the burning underground. It was just like looking into a furnace. It, it was wild. A lot of them, a lot of brush fires were started by the fire. You can see the trees are, are blackened. Just from it being that close to the surface, it just caught everything on fire. This actually used to be a park here at one time. You can see the evidence of the framework for the swings and all. <laughs> now, that wasn't in my time. That was probably back in my grandfather's time. But, but I mean, it's, it's just amazing to think back, you know, looking at it now and say, you know, 60, 70 years ago was, you know, green and the children played here and all. And you'd never guess looking at it now. The fire began in 1962. The fire company used to do a controlled burn of the, the garbage pit uh, you know, for Memorial Day uh, to make it uh, presentable because it was, it was such a close proximity to Oddfellow Cemetery. That dump was up next to the cemetery and they wanted to burn it off for the, the 30th of May and they lit the dump off fire so it wouldn't be sticking around the cemetery. They noticed within days that the fire was still burning in the dump. And, uh, and, and not too much after that, uh, they started observing uh, steam coming out of the sides of the walls of the, uh, the pit there. And, and so they knew that the fire had gotten into the mines.
We have bituminous coal and we have anthracite coal. And anthracite coal is, as far as anyone knows, the oldest coal on the planet. It's about 300 million years old. And if you think of coal in most parts of the world, it's like a layer cake. If you think of multiple layers, and you tilt it and skew it just a little bit, but that's the way coal seems right in most of the world, except in the anthracite region. And there, uh, that coal is literally older than the hills, and it follows the topography of the hills. It goes vertically uh, up, vertically down, sometimes it even goes upside down. And so the anthracite uh, mine fires, they go under the surface and they go deep in a hurry. Now in this part of the United States, we had a lot of heat and pressure more than anywhere else in the world, compressing out all the impurities in the vegetation and making the anthracite coal the purest coal in the world. 96% of all the anthracite in the United States, and that's three-fourths of the world's supply of anthracite coal is right here in this small part of Pennsylvania. But this anthracite coal, once you do get it burning, it does burn long and hot, okay? And it does continue the burn. That's what fuels the fire. I'd say probably about three, four homes stood just in this small plot of land. Because most of them were, were such as this. There were half a doubles. This one you'll, you'll see is an interesting feature, these brick columns. Where, where mine is a, is, a, is a duplex and both sides are, are still intact, this one, one neighbor moved away. And back in the late 80s, when they thought they were going to leave us here and everything was finished, you know, whoever wanted to stay was, was going to be allowed to stay. And what they did is they undertook, a, the government undertook a huge project and actually cut the half doubles directly in half, tore one half down. Behind these brick columns are steel beams, uh, bolted down in, into footings, and are used to help support the other half of the house that uh, is existing. Uh, insulation was added, walls were rebuilt, siding added, and the, the brick was basically for aesthetic purposes, just instead of having just steel, you know, pillars and, you know, there's so many rumors start. A lot of people think that they are indeed chimneys for the purpose of venting the fumes from underground, <laughs> dangerous carbon monoxide and what have you right on the, this corner here where that, that sign is, that was a Connington's gas station. I, I, I mean, I could walk up and down the block and I could basically tell you, you know, all my neighbors, where everyone, where everyone lived, I could tell you everything where it was at, where the, the funeral parlor was at, where the, the bank was at, post office, I could show you every lot and name, name the people, you know. These were all homes in along here too. This was, you know, people's backyards at one time. And off in the distance, you can see between the trees, another cemetery over there. That's basically where the whole mine fire started, over in that area, across 61. One branch moved in an easterly direction. Another branch moved south on the closed portion of 61. And the other part just came west. And that's what's currently burning through this area. That fire should have been put out, well, two weeks after it started. And it could have been done for a thousand dollars or so. They could have just uh, dug a, a simple trench, you know, in an area and removed the coal ahead of the fire, you know, in the area where it wasn't burning and just cut off the fuel supply. Many attempts had been made uh, to extinguish the fire. Uh, all failed um, because they ran out of money for the most part. A lot of people underestimated how hot it was and how quickly it was burning. They first tried to extinguish it with water and they dumped massive quantities of water down the uh, coal seam. Uh, they tried underground barriers using sand and fly ash. Uh, they tried digging a cutoff trench, but they were too slow getting it done. The fire was already past the trench by the time they dug it. It was a situation where, you know, okay, where we spent the 20000 that was allocated for this first project and the fire is just a little bit ahead of this, but we got to stop because we ran out of money. They were within days of putting out the fire. And because of the bureaucracy, they ran out of money. They had to open it up to bids. Three months goes by, the fire spreads, and then they don't have a viable way to put it out after that. 
when you know it's within a couple of days of putting out and then you lose your town skepticism is probably the the weakest word i could use the dramatic time in centralia was probably about 1983 when the reagan administration was resisting dealing with the problem and yet the fire at that time had broken through the barrier which was was expected to keep it out of the town and as it broke through the barrier really every month the fire developed and it burned rapidly under the town and smoke would billow out from the town caddy corner from where i live john coddington operated a service station he would have problems with gas escaping from his gas tanks and it was discovered that the reason why the gas was escaping was because the heat of the fire was actually heating up the gasoline, causing it to expand and coming out the overflow. The gas station apparently had been pumping gas at, at 130 degrees or something, uh, an enormous fire hazard. The fire was moving in kind of an east-west direction and the highway was kind of a north-south highway. It, uh, it was the main road through Centralia and it, it cut directly across the path of the mine fire. You had tremendous amounts of steam coming out of the sides of the highway. And when that fog and the steam combined, I mean if you drove into that, you literally did not know which way it was up. It was a very dangerous situation. Eventually, of course, the, 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 the roadway uh, became buckled and you, you, you couldn't, you know, it was impassable. They did try a couple times to, uh, you know, pump fly ash or non-combustible material down there, but it just wasn't enough. And so eventually they just closed the highway and rerouted it. Years ago, a lot of people did have in towards this area of town did have carbon monoxide monitors in their homes. They didn't have enough carbon monoxide meters for a period of time, so some of the people had to share them. And you never know when carbon monoxide is going to spike. So you could have it spike in your house and you don't have the meter to know. Some of my neighbors resorted to the old fashioned having canaries in their houses to see if the canaries would die. Generally, a carbon monoxide detector over time will tell you that you have an elevated level. And in the case in the Centralia area, those uh, detectors were reading, they were off the scale. They were activated in moments after putting them in those houses. Those houses had such high level of carbon monoxide. The night that my father collapsed, one of the things he, he said was like he was falling asleep in front of the TV, and he just thought he was tired. He collapsed and fell out of bed, and they went in and they couldn't, they couldn't wake him up. They had to take him to the hospital. Could have died if, if uh, Nobody had happened to find him in time, you know, and it was one of a number of scary incidents uh, that had started placing additional pressure on government. The biggest and, and scariest incident of all involved a, a 12 year old boy by the name of Todd Domboski. I seen smoke, so I went over to see if it was the mine fire, and when I did, I just fell right through. Uh, we were over at Coddington's gas station when Todd Domboski ran over to us. He was covered in mud and he was screaming and he said, help, 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 my grandmother's uh, yard fell in. Luckily for him, he had like an orange hunting hat on, and his cousin, from what I understand, crawled over on like his, uh, almost on his belly like a snake, and, and, and saw the orange hunting hat and just reached in and grabbed them and pulled them out. They administered oxygen. They rushed me to the hospital uh, for some blood gas tests. I was just covered in mud. Um, from the intense heat, I had heavy pants, heavy shirt, a heavy coat. It was baked on. I mean, you couldn't go to a car wash and blast me off. It was just baked on. If he did not hold on to those um, uh, roots, he would have slid down a gangway or down the slope, which was about 300 feet in depth. And if I recall, the temperatures recorded were anywhere from four to 600 degrees at the bottom of the hole. Todd Domboski's falling into the subsidence. It was such a shocking incident that uh, government could no longer ignore the Centralia mine fire you know, problem. Uh, 
you know, a 12 year old boy dropping out of sight into a, a subsidence that was filled with deadly gases. I mean, you can't get any more of a, of a wake up call than that. I don't know how many times I heard it said that unfortunately somebody was going to have to die before the government would do something about this. And then somebody almost did die. Emergency housing for six families moving into town. Red ribbons warning of the fuming fire in the mines below. State inspectors walking door to door to measure deadly fumes. Those were the sights that greeted Governor Thornburg when he came to Centralia. At the fire hall, hundreds of townspeople greeted him as well to learn of a first step towards solving their mine fire problem. No one, whether for financial or personal reasons, will be forced to sell their properties or move out of their homes. There was a conflict, I think, in people's minds about whether the right thing to do was to leave, and, and so people were asking money to leave, or whether the right thing to do was to solve the problem, and people were asking money to solve the problem. There was a lot of tension, a lot of fighting between neighbors, friends, even, even uh, family. You know, people, you had people that wanted to stay and people that wanted to move, and it, it caused qu quite a lot of problems. George and Mary Ellen Lokaitis hope to get a fair buyout for their home from the government. But with an air monitor in their living room, they have another reason to be happy about relocation being one step closer. That's the health of their children, and the Lokaitises want to move. Now we do. We just had a trip with the doctor with the young lad today. It's uh, chronic bronchitis, upper respiratory infections. Well, my, my grandfather, myself, and my, my parents were all adamant about staying. Um, unfortunately, uh, my uncle and his family left. They moved to a neighboring town. Uh, that was that was kind of upsetting. You know, it would have been nice if if everyone stayed. And they lived right over on the the next block over here on Locust Avenue. I could basically walk out my back gate, walk over the alley, and walk right into their their backyard. They were, you know, everyone was so close within distance. And I mean, obviously, right there, you can see, 20 years later, not a problem. They were in the the middle of that block, um, their neighbors were deciding to leave. They were afraid of having, you know, empty houses beside them, you know, fire hazard and all the other problems that could arise from, from that kind of a situation. And I guess they just uh, thought it would be best for them to, you know, to, to leave. I wish they would have stayed, but it was, you know, for everyone to make up their own mind. There was a, a small group of people who were very opposed to a, a general relocation. Uh, they, they wanted something simple done to stop the fire, and they did not want to leave. They would often say, we don't want the town torn apart. But unfortunately, there weren't many options. There, you know, they could either you know, relocate the people of Centralia, you know, uh, or they could dig a big trench down the middle of Centralia, which is gonna require doing the same thing anyway. The people who wanted to move and wanted to move for the safety of their family were almost cast as the bad guys, the demons in the town, by these individuals who didn't want to move. Oh, I got death threats. We became very vocal, and some of the people in town didn't like the fact that we were so vocal. We didn't want someone to die before action was taken on that fire. And, and the potential was there for someone to die was very definitely there. We knew something that had to be done. We knew something uh, had to change. I think there were about 1,100 people living there at the time. Uh, 500 families, I believe, was a figure. And it was getting worse every year. The fire was expanding, and there was no chance of getting the fire under control. So uh, uh, working with the state and the administration, uh, uh, we decided that what we'd try to do is buy the town. They basically they said it was a, an issue of money. All the studies they've done and the research, they, they figured it would be more cost efficient just to move, totally relocate all the people than to find a solution to put the fire out. $42 million was the amount that Congress eventually uh, appropriated, and, uh, and that was considerably less than the, the trenching options. Uh, the complete trenching option would have been like $650 million, somewhere in that area. And some of the lesser trenches, they were still talking, you know, 100, 200 million, you know, somewhere in there. So they saved a lot of money by 
relocation. For all those years, it was strictly voluntary. If you wished to move, you could. They would come in, put a valuation on your home, depending on square footage and all, measure it out. Real estate agents were brought in and they'd take comparable values of houses around the similar towns, try and determine a value. And then they would make you an offer, give you reasonable moving expenses and all. But I'll tell you what, when you see some of the homes that some of the people moved out of Centralia, what they moved into, they're a hell of a lot better than what they had. As people moved out, as people sold their houses to the government, the houses would be torn down. As soon as uh, so many properties are empty, um, they'll issue a contract and, and demolish everything. And they do it in such a way, I mean, there's no visible sign that anyone ever lived there. Everything is backfilled, uh, refuse taken to a local landfill, and there's a very little sign that there was ever a home there. Why do you think they do it that way? I, I couldn't really say. When they start knocking down some of the bigger town landmarks, like the American Legion and things of that, it's, it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's just like, okay, that's it. Now the town's, town, town really is gone, it's gone, you know? There's no place to go back to. Back in, back in the 80s and, and all, when they were really tearing homes down, they'd wait till they got a group of 30. They'd basically wait till the whole block was empty. They'd get everybody out and they'd demolish, they'd level the whole entire block. And then as more and more single homes were left, they'd wait till they get a couple. But now I, I don't really know what's gonna happen with this one. Yeah, he, he used to raise pigeons, that was his hobby. And he would actually, they're homing pigeons. <laughs> and he would race them. He would, he would send them away and they would actually, him and a bunch of other members in his club would time them how long it would take them to get back. It, it was just neat in the summer to, to watch them, they, just the formation, the way they, they would circle over the house. And they're very tame. They'd come back and uh, he had many, many trophies he, for, for doing that. He always appreciated, you know, the fact that I kept a flag flying up there because he used that um, as his judge of wind direction. So he, you know, know if it would be a good flying day for the pigeons or not. <laughs> Closest neighbor, I guess, now would be uh, Carl Woomer lives up in that house. Most. Uh, Generally, you wouldn't think of, you know, you think of neighbors as being next door neighbors, but in, in Centralia, pretty much someone could be five blocks away and they're your neighbor now, you know? <laughs> it's, it's not so much proximity, but... I said, and everyone, everyone is still pretty close-knit. Everyone looks out for everybody, and... Actually, I find it very hard, really, to, to give an accurate description of, 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 of Centralia today. Well, you come up the road from Ashland and you hit the top of town and you see this, this, just this vast expanse. Except off to the right, there's a, there's a house. In the middle of nowhere, there's a house. It used to be rows of homes. It's now fields with a, a home here and a home there, or a building here and a building there. The first time I saw it, I was expecting more, I think. I got there and it's just open fields, open land with a couple of houses. I think maybe I expected to see a ghost town. What you see is no town. And uh, until you compare that to the pictures, it's hard to realize what used to be there. My grandmother's house was probably, her yard probably started somewhere right around in here. They had a, a, a big backyard, we had a, uh, uh, like I said, a, a, a shed, and uh, that's where, where it all took place. It's amazing. I think in 
1962 in uh, Memorial Day weekend when the fire started, there were about 1,600 people in the town and approximately close to 700 or 800 buildings. Um, and today there's about 10. I heard about Centralia in about 1998 from a friend of mine. She said, I have to show you Centralia. You're not going to believe this. And when I saw it, she was absolutely right. It was something, even though I had heard about it, it made me feel very sad. It was the bitter absence of all life. It was just a town that used to be there and isn't anymore. It stayed with me. My feelings and my thoughts stayed with me all the way home. You know how you get something caught in your claw? This was caught, and I had to write about it. So I just sat down with the pad, and I started to write my thoughts and my feelings. It says it was written, submitted by Deanna M. Hellman. It's entitled, A Town That Was. As the summer sun beats down, the ghastly heat rises up from the charred remains of a town that was and a people who were. Gone is the vibrant community, beautiful neighborhood, scattered bricks, crumpled roads, bent pipes releasing toxic gases are left to inhabit this land today. Smoke pockets curl up to greet you, and the earth is hot to the touch, for the fire continues to rage in a coal vein out of control beneath the town that was. One wonders how it all began, when and how it will all end, and what became of the people who lived in the town that was. That's that stuff that I, I you know, I, it looks badly, you know, for the town and, and people, you know, I mean, of course, that's only one poem, but like I said, when, when stuff is put out, you know, in mass media of that nature, it really makes it, it's really a, a negative for the borough. The last election was just, just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I don't know how many voted, but there was only 11 people in town here anymore. <laughs> I don't believe there is a legal entity of Centralia at this time. I don't believe there are enough people there to be a borough. I don't believe they have the necessary public meetings. I don't believe they have elected officials, or at least not officials who were elected uh, in an election certified by the Columbia County or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Actually, the unique thing about Centralia, we don't own anything any longer. Um, back in 1992 was another turning point, and that's when the program suddenly changed from voluntary to mandatory. Um, the state took steps they wanted to add. After, like I said, they just spent, you know, thousands of dollars to fix up these remaining homes. And then in 1992, there was a policy change, and they, they invoked the powers of eminent domain and condemnation, and they said that everyone would have to leave. The government owns everything in town, the buildings, um, the ground, everything. So the only thing basically I have is the, the clothes on my back and the furniture in the house. <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been living in that house since basically for the last decade uh, in, in, in government-owned property. A lot of people call us squatters. Um, <laughs> everything is all the legal steps are in place where they could put us out any time they wanted to, but they haven't forced the issue. I think it's basically because of the age of the people. It would be such bad press, you know, to, to show, you know, sheriffs coming in and removing, like, say, our 87-year-old mayor from his home. I don't think the government knows what they want to do. I think they ain't going to bother us at all. Eventually, if they don't die out, they're going to be forced out. That's, I really believe that. And I, I hope they go kicking and screaming. I really do. The government promised them that they would not be forced out of their homes. This is what the government said. But I think, you know, government is government, and government lies through its teeth. You know, I don't trust government, and I have good reason not to. Because for years, government lied to us in Centralia. They lied to us. I'm um, the 100 block of here of West Park Street. 
on the uh, south side, and then I mow about three city blocks worth on the north side of West Park Street. Um, I mow the western uh, 200 block just about of South Locust Avenue, and that's about all. So, so it's a couple city blocks worth of the lawns. He does a great job up there, especially on the Legion yeah, grounds. He, he cuts all that grounds for us up there. He cuts over there by where Moyer's house is. Yeah. That's a lot of grass to cut up there, I told you. See, that there, where the Legion was, that property ran back to the school. That was yeah. a big property they had there in town. Right across the street from, from the house here where I cut, uh, the one lot was the American Legion building itself, of course, and then there was quite a, a large grassy plot, and then next to it, um, on the western side of it, was the uh, former Hubert Eicher High School, it used to be the Centralia High School. All the other lots um, that I maintained were completely filled with houses, houses and garages from, from one end of the alley to the other. Originally, the state used to take care of a lot of it, and they used to do the maintenance, and with budget cuts and whatever, they just didn't have enough money to continue to have people come out and contracts and uh, maintain the lawn. So rather than see everything get overgrown, that's when I just kind of picked up where they left off. See, you got to figure, now, the mayor, he's, you said 92. Okay, uh, there, there ain't many young ones there. You know, it's sad there's just no one really to take care of things anymore, so, and some of the older people I used to, they're no longer around, so I just, you know, try and help out, do whatever I can. Twenty years ago, that, that entire section was empty, and I mean, it's just, it's amazing you know, think, you know, that's just people's desire, even though they moved out of town, it's still their wish to be brought back here and be buried here in, you know, in their hometown. So there's, and they're still, they're still selling lots and, you know, people are, are still coming back. It might not be nice to, to talk about, but it was always a, a joke with um, our undertaker that used to live in town here. and. Uh, his mother lived there here in Centralia, and she'd probably still be here if she was alive. She had no desire to move, but when she passed on, he, he sold the home because he has his, his own business in Mount Carmel. And he always said, well, people might leave Centralia, but, you know, one day I'm going to bring them back. <laughs> True to life, he does. Uh, this is uh, where my grandparents, uh, the house that I now live in, this is the monument that I designed for them. The rain kind of pummeled the Easter flower somewhat, but, <laughs> but I, I, I put uh, three most important things on it. What I felt, our home on the left side, and then a picture, an image of St. Ignatius Church in the center, and my grandfather's coal mine on the right. It's true to life, the way, the way it appears with the, the church, you know, the house being down there and the church being up on the hillside, just as it was in town, and then the coal hole what we call the coal hole, the coal mine being behind the church, which uh, was right out that road about a mile outside of town. It was uh, the former Germantown colliery. And then my grandfather leased the ground in the 1960s, and he had his own coal mine there known as the r &L Coal Company, being uh, Ravinus and Lokitis, his, his other partner, who operated with him. And he ran that for about 10 years till he retired in, in 1969. And that's, that's another reason I, uh, I searched everywhere until I could find a, a granite black enough that would, would resemble anthracite coal as close as possible. See, there used to be another stone here that he had bought himself when my grand died back in, in 1981. And it, you know, it was kind of plain like these other ones. And I always thought, well, you know, 
if anything ever happened to him, I was going to, you know, put a special, you know, memorial up there, you know, to both of them. I want, I want something unique and something that kind of, you know, told a story. And, and I, I hope I've achieved that. Put everything, you know, what was important to them and, you know, tried to capture that. So I, I figured in, you know, in case, you know, someday, I mean, none of us are going to live forever, you know. <laughs> Someday Centralia may be, you know, completely gone from the face of the earth, but there will always be a record here of, of what used to be here, and at least in a little form. The house which was important to, to not only her, but both of them, and then the, the coal company that was important to him. Well, Centralia always has been about mining. That was the reason that people started coming there. There were uh, mines beginning in about the late 1840s. There aren't many regions in Pennsylvania which are so specific to a single commodity. Anthracite is all there is economically, historically, in the region. The reason that anybody has settled there is anthracite. Before coal, it was wilderness. Now you have to remember mostly, when it was a working mine, guys, no light bulbs. So they done all this work, guys, with very little light. Miner came in, crawl up the ladder, pull the boards out to load the car. And these old coal cars, no brakes. Best way to slow the car down is with one of these, call a sprag. Very popular job with the young boys in the mine, especially the ones could run fast, they were called runners. When the car was going downhill, a young boy would run along the car, sprag in each hand. He'd bounce at one time, and in the spoke of the wheel it went, that when the wheel went around, the sprag would hit and slow the car down. If his light goes out, then he's in trouble. Workers suffered enormous risk. The, the number of ways to die in a coal mine are, are, are limitable. There are train wrecks and there are explosions and there's poisonous gas and there's rocks falling from the ceiling there's people falling and there's there's uh, explosive gases and there's dynamite dangers you know being kicked by mules being electrocuted i calculated once that any given worker if he if he worked a 40-year career would have about one chance in 10 of dying in the ground just in pennsylvania over 200 years of mining more men died than the vietnam war there was a death a day back in the heyday. And what that did, I, I think, in, in Centralia and other towns in the Anthracite region was to make them very tight-knit. I mean, people understood that they needed to help each other out because they never knew when the man of the house might be delivered dead back, you know, from a mine accident. At its boom, the Anthracite region was employing probably 100,000 men as active miners. But the, the potential supply of labor was enormous because this was the, the great deluge of immigration into the U.S. We in America are immigrants, or the children of immigrants. We are one people, but a people welded from many nations and races. People who came to America during a vast migration from Europe to other parts of the world. From about 1870 to about 1920, an immigration happened, which is called the Great Deluge, this great flood of immigrants. 
the standard pattern was for somebody to have contact with somebody in the old country. So we'd have a, a chain migration where someone would settle in, in a town, someone would settle in Johnstown, and then they'd write back to, to Germany and they would say, things are pretty good in Johnstown. And so the, the universe which was known by these immigrants was a, was a very small area, as one town. I'm a fifth generation Centralian. There are five generations of, of, of my family buried in St. Ignatius Cemetery. Now, that, that's a long time. My, my, my great, great grandfather came to Centralia off the boat from Ireland in, in either 1854 or 1856. I mean, he lived there before Centralia was even a borough. You know, before Centralia was Ireland, it wasn't anywhere else in this country. Uh, back when the, in the very earliest beginnings of the town, it was just pretty much a, a highway passing through a dirt road. I believe it was Alexander Ray. He was more or less the founder of the town, if you will. He wanted to name it Centerville. But there was already a Centerville in, um, in Pennsylvania. And so, you know, it's all for post office purposes. So he called it, um, uh, he called it Centralia because it was the center of everything. We've had that name ever since 1866 when the borough was incorporated. Over 125 years later, with everything that's taken place, someone in Harrisburg or Lancaster, one of the postal officials, decided since there were so few people here, they want to completely wipe Centralia off the map and just uh, have us go under the next closest neighboring town, Ashland. We got letters in the mail stating that we could no longer use Centralia on any of our mail, and they were basically wiping out our identity. Naturally, that didn't set well with me or any of the other townspeople. I was at work in Harrisburg at the time, and I, I left early and I came home. I got all the media coverage I could. I had uh, WNEP come down from Scranton Wilkesbury. I, I remember that day the lady delivering the mail from the post office. She was afraid to even come on the street. <laughs> she she would not drive the vehicle over when she saw you know everything that was going on. And with all the publicity, the post office backed down quickly on that idea. And while they still did change our zip code, which in actuality was only one digit, the very last digit was changed, we were still allowed to keep the name of the town intact of Centralia. So I thought that was great. Well, it, it's just what, you know, where it's always been home and you, I couldn't imagine, you know, changing it. It would, it would be like calling Washington, D.C. something different after all these years. It's just, you know, something you shouldn't, shouldn't try and change. I'm always struck by how people in the anthracite region see the landscape that they live in, and, and there's such a big disconnect between what I hear them talking about and what I as an outsider see when I drive through the area. And I, I see broken black rock in, in, in big sheets with no vegetation on it, and, and, and they see something else. This is the nicest town in the, in the state, as far as I'm concerned. I worked in construction work, and I lived out of a suitcase for, for 28 years. But every, every weekend I could make it home. And in Centralia, it would always look better than the place I left, <laughs> all over this eastern part of the state of York. I don't even really give the fire a second thought, you know, you've just been living here so long and it, it doesn't even bother me or faze me. <laughs> just kind of, basically you just ignore it, you know, you just live life as normal and it's, it's unusual, you know, not owning your own home and everything, but you just kind of put it out of your mind. What I miss is that when I go there to visit. I really have no hometown. It's kind of like a man without a country. I have no hometown um, to go back to. So 
There's no visiting old neighbors. There's no going to the local, you know, restaurant to see, you know, people or whatever. Really, the only time you get to run into old neighbors is Memorial Day weekend. Again, our nation has assembled here to honor its heroic dead. A thousand battles of land, sea, and air echo the glory of their valiant deeds. You'll be surprised on the 30th of May, the people that come from all over. You see people you haven't seen. Now, I have friends I ain't seen in years. Ah, some of them, they've been gone so long, I don't know if I've known them if I've seen them. It's fun to see those people and, and reminisce with them, but there's really no place to reminisce. I mean, you can't say, oh, stop down at my mom's house or my dad's house. So you have to stand in the cemetery and talk to these people for a while, and, and then you say, oh, it's really sad what happened to town, and, and then you move on. At one point, I, you know, it was my hope that, you know, maybe the state would finally, you know, say, okay, you are here, you know, we'll give you your property back. That's, that's my hope. And maybe turn over the rest of the land to the borough, and then we could, you know, start, you know, selling off lots and rebuild the town. That's, that's still, you know, I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but that's, that's my hope and dream. I would, I would love to see the town rebuilt. If they'd sell property here that people could build homes, there'd be homes going up in this town. Unfortunately, the government is so, so against that. I mean, even though there's, there's no real visible danger here, there's still, for some reason, they still want us out badly. Clearly, there are still dangers in Centralia. You know, you can see it where the fire is burning, where it's still, it's kind of moving through the town now and out the other end. There could be more subsidences. There could be more Todd dombowski like subsidences. Do I think this could have happened to someone else? Absolutely, absolutely. There was no downplaying it. I mean, it's a mindset. I mean, you can you can you can live in denial and, and, and think what you want to think, but the smoke is there. The danger is there. And we see these people coming in and they're smelling the smoke coming out of the ground. And everything stomping else. their foot to see if it's going to give way. You know, you know they're you too never damn know dumb to realize if it does, they're going down. Yeah. The danger, of course, is that mountain is honeycombed with coal seams, and uh, if that fire somehow finds its way into those other seams, it could continue burning for hundreds of years. And coal is porous. The gases seep through. And so the houses are on top of the coal, and those gases are seeping up through the ground and into the houses. I hate to go as far as to call people liars, but <laughs> I guess there's not much, you know, not much else you can do sometimes. I just think they really highly, highly overplayed that, that carbon monoxide issue. Um, I mean, naturally, in the, you know, in the combustion of coal, you know, it is, it is a byproduct, but I don't believe it was coming into as many homes as, as they said it was. I just, I just can't, I can't envision that. I, and now, I mean, no one that lives here in Centralia now has any problems whatsoever with it. What are some of, some of your fondest memories as a kid in Centralia? I'd have to say one of them would be, would be Christmas time. The whole town back then used to be decorated. Locust Avenue from the southern end to the northern end and Center Street. They had all, you know, Christmas decorations on the telephone poles and, 
And it just, it was like, it would remind, it would put you in mind of that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, with Jimmy Stewart. I mean, it was just that kind of atmosphere. It was, it was awesome. This decoration, believe it or not, um, the garland actually I had uh, from California. I ordered it in because it's uh, it's commercial grade. It's half PVC and half mylar, and, and you, it's not something you can buy in the stores around here. So I just uh, that was again one of the old um, Centralia Borough Christmas decorations that used to hang throughout the town, and I, I bought several of them years ago and uh, refurb you know refurbished them, put new wiring on and new garland, and, and this one I just did this year. I think it came out pretty decent. Years ago when I was a kid, one of those candles used to hang on uh, the main telephone pole out there on the, in the intersection. And they went through pretty much most of the town. And then these, these trees, they were at the, um, the four entrances to town. So they had, they had quite a wide variety of, uh, of decorations. And then the, like that lantern on the far pole, that, that hung downtown on uh, Center Street. We're talking back in the 1970s <laughs> you know, when the town was still full. These are the two trees on the opposite poles, like I said, that I, I uh, completely rewired for this Christmas season. Of course, like with, with time and age, you know, the wiring goes bad and lights and things don't work as good as they used to. So I, I had to strip all the garland off completely, uh, take everything apart just down to the bare frame. And I put new, uh, brand new electrical wiring on it. I ordered from a regular, uh, company that deals specifically in, in municipal Christmas decorations and got the outdoor grade wiring. Um, there's exactly 50 bulbs on it and they're the, the larger C9 outdoor bulbs. Put that all together then reattached the garland to it. And that was quite a few hours involved in it but I think they came out pretty decent. There's probably over 2,500 lights combined on all the trees total couple hundred feet worth of extension cord so it takes a lot to run it and all but it, it looks good at nighttime a lot of people that formerly lived here they they come and they admire it and if I happen to meet someone you know in a neighboring town in the grocery store or whatever and you know they'll compliment on it and it makes you feel good you know and they're they're happy to see see things still you know traditions carried on Anthracite coal reached its, its, its peak of production probably uh, in the early 1920s, uh, and, and it was still pretty strong after that, but when the Depression came, uh, things started going downhill. At about that same time, bituminous became competitive in, in, in the eastern cities because of transportation. Very shortly after that, petroleum became important. And petroleum is, ex is extremely important because it's so much better as a domestic fuel. Well, the coal region just dried up. That was it, the whole area. Not only here, up around Scranton, the whole works. It yeah. all went bad, you couldn't buy a job. So everybody was heading all over. When I went up to Centralia the first time, I went to Mount Carmel. And it, it, it's a small town, and there were 180 buildings for sale. The populations of the towns shrank as well, but the populations shrank much, much more slowly than did the employment and did the, did the economics. Well, obviously, the, the mining jobs largely disappeared. Mines closed down. Uh, people had to find work elsewhere. They, you know, it just wasn't a situation where, you know, sons followed fathers into the mines because the mines weren't operating anymore. At one time I, I did hope to work uh, for the Department of Environmental Resources and go into mine ins inspecting and do something in that field. Um, I went to college up in Bloomsburg for geography and environmental planning. It was just it was just so tough to get into in the you know the department. There are just not many openings and 
from what I told, from what I'm being told, the, the regulations are becoming more stringent, and it's driving a lot of the mine operators out of business. So I, there's less and less need for inspectors. And I said, you know, maybe it's a good thing things didn't take that route. I was driving to the airport one day and to catch a very early flight, and so I found myself driving down the river at, uh, at like like six o'clock in the morning, and I came to the little town of Dauphin, and the town of Dauphin is where the road from the coal region comes down to go to Harrisburg, and all of a sudden, it shifted from an occasional truck to commuting, and the, and the commuting are these are people who are driving, again, 70 miles from the coal region to work at Three Mile Island, to work at the, the Army Depot, to work for the government in Harrisburg, um, and, and that's, a, that's an enormous investment in a place. I mean, it's a, it's a daily investment of a number of hours so that they can be in a place. My day starts usually about uh, 4.30 in the morning. I get up and prepare to travel down to my job in Harrisburg at the state police. I'm an accounting assistant uh, in the firearms unit. Usually I'm leaving town about, I say about quarter or six in the morning. I'll stop up at the cemetery and open the gates before I leave and head down Interstate 81 down to Harrisburg. Depending on traffic and weather conditions, if, uh, if everything goes smoothly, it's generally about an hour drive one way, 60 miles in one direction. I've been down there 10 years now going back and forth, so I've, I've logged a lot of miles. <laughs> Basically, any any you know any given day, I think about my neighbors. You know, I, I miss miss them greatly. You know, they're were you know a big part of my life growing up. Yeah, I, I I can remember you know everybody just just waiting for me to get back home, so I made sure you know that I was safe. And you know, it was nice. You know, like people you know looked out for you and worried about you. And it's it's kind of different now. You know, coming home and there's like I said on the block and there's there's no one here any longer. It's just it's it's so different. It's just. It's, I don't know how to describe it, but you know, a lot of people say, well, why, you know, why don't you move to Harrisburg now that, you know, mostly everyone's gone, but still, like I said, regardless of how empty it is, it's still, it's still home. You know, I still have my attachments here. Um, and I really, I just, I can't imagine, you know, living anywhere else. I just, I don't think I'd be happy. I usually get back about generally after four o'clock in the afternoon to, to town and have my supper and hang out at the house and then depending on what time of the year it is there's either you know more work to do or less. <laughs> People in the anthracite region have always had lots of reasons to leave. They're always been lots of reasons not to be there. Every town has a declining housing stock, every town is being depopulated, and every town has fewer good jobs than people want, and in every town people have been able to say, yes, but I want to stay here. And in, and in Centralia there's just one more problem, and the problem is the fire, but, it, but the fire gets in line with all the other problems that people have had, all the other reasons that people have had to leave, and people have been able to overcome those reasons because of the extraordinary draw of the place, because of the extraordinary fondness of a community that they have created. Well, the elderly people, I think, remain because it's their home, and they just don't want to leave their home. I mean, they have a lot invested in their home. This is where their memories are. Why someone who's younger stays, uh, that's really an individual question. That would be hard for me to answer. I know if I was in that situation, I would not be there. Oh, I think there's a, a certain spirit of being able to tough it out, of, uh, uh, of being able to stay where others can't. Uh, you know, the anthracite mining is historically a very tough business. Uh, miners do a job that others wouldn't want to do, and they wouldn't do anything else. They're proud of what it takes to do a job so difficult, and uh, uh, they're proud of that toughness, they're proud of their independence. And I think they see it as, a, some of them see it as a, a, a badge of courage. 
and uh, they don't see a need to leave. Anyone that has adamantly defied the unfortunate circumstances that happened in 1980 and will still be here if they're allowed in 2010, you've got to admire that. You, you, you really do. You don't have to agree with it, but you got to admire that, that fortitude. You know, I always told my grandfather, he said, I'm satisfied to stay here for the rest of my life, and, and that's why, you know, he entrusted the house to me. Um, we did do a, a deed up in the Bloomsburg Courthouse, although they, they told me it wasn't really official since everything was condemned prior to that, but at least we, you know, we, we have that document on file anyway. <laughs> I guess home was just important if if the rest of the world was as nasty as it was when people moved to this place in 1870 and 1900. If the rest of the world was a company trying to wring every nickel out of you and the rest of the world was a 12-hour job in a dark, dangerous mind or the rest of the world was a 14-year-old boy picking slate, that people developed a, a place that was safe and, and people invested heavily in that and, and people developed mechanisms to protect themselves against the risks of the world. And in a real sense, those mechanisms continue to protect them, but they protect them against leaving. They protect them against going, perhaps when it would be adaptive to go. These portraits on the wall are of my great-grandparents, George and Julia Lokaitis, who actually used to live only a block away from me. And these were their wedding photos from 1910. Fortunately, this is one of the houses that does have indoor plumbing. My my great-grandparents, uh, that was over a block away, They're, the only plumbing in the house was the kitchen sink. They still uh, had the old outhouse, and I can wow. remember using that as a kid. So, I mean, that's just how old some of these houses were. Even when, like, even when my grandfather quit smoking when he got older, I, we always, you know, he never put it away, he just kept it there, so I just kind of left it there. That's so pretty much the houses it has remained, you know, unchanged all these years. It's just pretty much the way it was when I was a kid. It's, you know, I'm 34 now, and things are, you know, just about the same as, as I can remember growing up. That's that's my grandmother. This is a is a meat slicer, and like I said, you can still see that in the picture, the original uh, clothes dryer. Uh, she was, I guess she was probably sitting in that chair. That's why I said things have pretty much remained unchanged, you know, all these years. It's home. I just, I don't think I'd be happy living anywhere else, you know. This is, this is where I've always, I mean, even when, you know, I lived up with my parents up on East Park Street, you know, this was still more like home, this, you know. It was always the one constant in my life. We all watch I'm Gone with the Wind, and we all applaud when Scarlett O'Hara says, it's the land. Well, why would we think these people would be any different? It's not the way it looks. It's the memories that are associated with it. It's the history. Pennsylvania's mineral riches uh, built this country. The first cannons from the Revolutionary War came from uh, iron ore and limestone in Pennsylvania's mines. We uh, built the uh, railroads, we built the barbed wire that tamed the West, we rebuilt Europe after two world wars, and then uh, industry and the rest of the country sort of moved on and left us with this mess. And it's, uh, Centralia is one part of that tragedy. We know, we know how to start towns. We know how to build a town and lay a town out. And we know something about what to do as towns decline, but we really don't know how to sort of close them up. We don't know what the end of a town is. We can look at boom towns, a lumber town or, or an oil town or, or a gold town in the West, which grew up and had 
just a couple of years of business, and people left, and, and the town was gone, and the town's collapsed. But these aren't boom towns. These are towns with, with, which have had families and old folks and young folks and schools and churches in it. We don't know how to close them. We don't know when a, we don't know when a town is over, and we don't know what to do. They just they just sort of linger. I would not want to live in Centralia, you know. Now, I mean, I, I want a community with people in it. You know, there's there's no people left there. I look at my own you know neighborhood here. Would I want to live here if, if 90% or more of, of the houses were torn down and the people moved somewhere else? No. In my viewpoint, it's not a community. Centralia, in my viewpoint, is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It, it was my home for so long. You know, it still is my home, in a way, even though there's nothing there to call home, except my future home in St. In St. Higgies. But I, you know, it, it is a very sad thing. It's a very sad experience driving through there. When you think of what used to be, and you think of why it is as it is, and you realize the futility of it all. But you can't resurrect the past. You put your foot forward and march. It's the only thing you can do. As a summer sun beats down, the ghastly heat rises up from the charred remains of a town that was and a people who were. Gone is the vibrant community, beautiful neighborhood, scattered bricks, crumpled roads, bent pipes releasing toxic gases are left to inhabit this land today. Smoke pockets curl up to greet you, and the earth is hot to the touch, for the fire continues to rage in a coal vein out of control beneath the town that was. One wonders how it all began, when and how it will all end, and what became of the people who lived in the town that was.